Um, and next, the principal's report that we have this month is the high school. So we have Ms. Watson and Ms. Deep, I believe. Mr. Ringett. Oh, Ms. Ringett. <laughs> I can't see that far. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear, so it's, it's good. You can't see, we can't hear. It's wonderful. <laughs> Well, good evening, Chairperson King, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. We are pleased to be your first meet and greet of the 21, um, 2021 school year. There's no pressure. No, of course <laughs> not. You guys, we're, we're good. We're That's good. Example for, the rest of so, um, for those of you that don't know me um, or for people at home, my name is Angela Watson. I'm the high school principal. This is actually my 23rd year in the district. I've worn many hats, started as a math teacher, became an assistant principal served as the principal of the middle school for a year, then came back over to the high school where I served as the high school principal, still serving in that capacity. Um, surrounding me, couldn't do it without these three great individuals. So we have three assistant principals at the high school. I will start um, right here on my left with Ms. Beach. Hi there, I'm Yolanda Beach, and I work with students whose last names begin with the letters P through Z. This is my eighth year here at ER and my 24th year in secondary education, and my 30th year in education across multiple levels. And um, I love being here, hands down. <laughs> and next up is Mr. Ringette. Hi, I'm Robert Ringette, one of the assistant principals. I take care of caseload A through F for the alphabet. This is my 18th year at Bridgewater Ramp. And Mr. Bresnahan. Good evening. So I'm Tom Bresnahan. I work with students uh, G to O. This is my 30th year in education, and this is my 10th year as a high school assistant principal. Six years at uh, Bridgewater Ryan Bridgewater. So just a little um, overview of the high school for those of you that don't know um, or just newly familiar to it. We service a little over 1,340 students. Um, quick umbrella overview. We offer three levels of classroom programming from academic to accelerated up to AP. One of our proudest moments was when we opened enrollment for AP, so there's no academic restrictions on our AP program. Whoever wants to enroll in an AP program, um, regardless of academic level, can do so. Um, we're very proud of our extracurriculars that we offer from typical extracurriculars and sports to our atypical, like ultimate frisbee, our TJ Squared Robotics team is um, off the charts, as well as our fabulous Rainwater Players production. Um, I always say we have something at VR for everyone, and if we don't, our kids really are encouraged to come up with new clubs. So we have a sign language club. I think Ms. Beach and I just got an email about a uh, community, international community, community outreach, outreach club. And cosmetology is another one. Cosmetology is coming. But it's great because from children, our clubs are really born. That's how we have our step team. That's how DECA came to be. So it's really great. We do encourage the kids, hey, if, if something isn't there for you to get involved in, because honestly, getting involved is the number one thing, and it makes your high school experience kind of the things that you really remember looking back. Um, as Ms. Joyce offered up just before, we are focused on the acceleration roadmap, that first pillar about building families, building community, building relationships. <laughs> We stress to our staff before the school year started, SEL, social emotional learning, is our number one. It's your foundation. Um, we tell the teachers all the time, like, don't think of it as another thing on your plate. It is the plate. Th this is the foundation. Kids don't learn from people they don't like. Kids will learn more. They will do more for you if they know that you love them and that you respect them and that you're going to support them and that you're just invested in them as a human being. So. If you walk the halls for like the first week to week and a half, you saw a whole lot of fun SEL stuff going on. Whether it was surveys, get to know you, um, would you rather games, a lot of wellness walks. Um, the teachers have really, really embraced this. Uh, we had a faculty meeting today where we actually reviewed the acceleration roadmap with them. And we talked about that, that tier about building relationships, which was really great. But they're doing a great job. Um, we're off to a great start. It's only been like two weeks a little over two weeks, but um, the kids have really risen to the occasion and uh, we're doing great. So we're very thankful for your support over the years. Again, 23 years. I always say we have one of the best school committees around, even though the faces change. The support's always there. We do appreciate that. Our door's always open. If you ever want to stop by or email us or, or call, we're here. So 
Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate that. And I'm really excited. I know if a lot of us, like my daughters are younger, so, and you know, I've met you, but I haven't really met all of the vice principals. So it's, it's nice to see their face and get to kind of know what you're doing at the high school, you know, who are the faces there for when our children get older, or if you don't have children currently in the district, so we know them. Um, do we have questions for um, Ms. Watson or any of the vice principals? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thank you. <coughs> All right, on to administrative and school committee reports. We have the report of the superintendent with Mr. Swenson. Thank you, Madam Chair. We uh, start first with uh, school reopening. We've had a relatively smooth uh, school reopening. All of our uh, grounds and buildings were in fantastic shape thanks to our um, hardworking custodial maintenance and grounds crew under the direction of Mr. Pacheco. Uh, all of our curriculum resources and uh, Mr. Shots worked very hard to get all of our technology out to our buildings in the last uh, couple of weeks. Myself, Mr. Powers, Mrs. Joyce, Mrs. Richards, Mrs. Moore, uh, Mrs. Berrios, uh, Mr. Jovalos, we all had the opportunity uh, to go out and visit all of our buildings in the last uh, few weeks. And it was great to see our classrooms filled and our teachers teaching and the energy that was in uh, all of our buildings and the engagement level of, of all of our students. Uh, we did uh, run at a few bumps in the road as uh, any school year uh, will at uh, the start of the school year, uh, mostly in the area of, of transportation. We have been working very hard um, with Mrs. George, myself, and Mr. Jovalos, working with Lucene bus lines, mostly for our uh, van transportation right now in some of the routing. We've been working with them the last uh, week or so to really examine our routes and see how they could uh, be more effective and efficient. Uh, the last few days have uh, been much better, but I do want to just extend you know, an apology to our uh, van families and students. I know that it has been somewhat difficult uh, over the course of the last uh, week or so. So I appreciate your patience uh, and understanding in regards to um, this matter. And again, we'll continue to work uh, diligently to remedy any of these issues uh, in the routing. I'm gonna give Mr. Jovalos credit. He hopped on a van and actually uh, drove uh, for us this week in a, in a, in a pinch. So kudos to you, uh, Mr. Jovalos, for everything that you do. Uh, for your department, but uh, especially for our children. So thank you. Um, we, this uh, uh, last few weeks too, we have been able to implement all of our mitigation practices. Um, we have had um, you know, a few situations at our schools, but I will say that our nursing staff, which I say um, each and every year is uh, second to none. And the implementation of our uh, new testing programs Symptomatic testing and test and test and stay have um, really helped us uh, the last uh, few weeks to keep students in school. Uh, so I want to give uh, kudos to Mrs. Grennan, our nurse leader, and um, all of our nurses who are working uh, incredibly hard each and every day in order to um, you know, continue to push through through uh, this pandemic and still keep our students in school. Um, other than that, it's been, again, like I said, a relatively uh, smooth opening, and I just want to wish all of our students, staffs, and families a wonderful uh, school year and moving forward. So if anyone has any questions regarding the opening, concerns, thank you. All right. Um, we'll go on to our uh, boards of health, and I'll give you a quick um, COVID update, and Mr. Powers, as some of our um, local members in terms of the district. But one thing that we are running into right now is that the town of Rainham currently does not have a health agent. So we do meet uh, with our health agents every Tuesday. Mrs. King joins us on those calls in the past as the chair, um, Mr. Dolan had met on those calls. So we are um, trying to work uh, right now, navigate on the town of Raynham without a, a health agent. But uh, we uh, have had some conversations with Mr. Badger, who is the health agent on the Bridgewater side. Just wanna kind of give some numbers over the course of uh, the last two weeks from September 3rd up until 
um, September 16th. And the new numbers will be coming out um, tomorrow. Uh, right currently in the town of Bridgewater, there are 24 positive cases with a 2.7% uh, positivity rate. Uh, of those 24 cases, uh, 30, 13, I'm sorry, are pediatric cases. 12 of those 13 were school aged with one under the age of five. On the rain amp side, um, we just had some difficulties getting these numbers, but we were able to get the uh, positive cases currently from September 3rd to September 16th. Currently 39 cases uh, with a 3.31 positivity rate in the town. One kind of trouble spot we were not able to get to drill down those numbers were the pediatric cases um, and those that were school aged. So that's hopefully information that I'm going to be able to. I know I reached out to <laughs> Mrs. Lavarento today uh, for uh, some assistance there, but um, we, I contacted the uh, town administrator, contacted the health inspector who was unfortunately not available, talked to her clerk, reached out to a selectman as well. We're just having difficulties kind of getting our hands on those numbers, but we will. And when we do, I will make sure to uh, report those out readily. Just wanted to kind of ask Mr. Powers if he could uh, kind of speak to, um, you know, within the district, what we've been kind of encountering for the last uh, two and a half weeks with some of our cases, um, positive cases within the district and some of the close contact tracing and testing that we've been able to put in place. Happy to share, Mr. Swenson, um, Madam Chair, members of the school committee. Uh, so we are required now to report cases uh, on a weekly basis to DESI. Their reporting week is a little bit different than a Monday through Friday. We actually report cases Thursday through Wednesday. Uh, everything has to be submitted by Wednesday at 5 p.m. And they're releasing this data on Thursday. I know Mr. Swenson uh, is sharing a district tracker uh, that encompasses a Monday through Friday approach. So I just, you know, I throw that out there to start because some of these numbers may not completely match up to uh, all those different trackers. But just to give you a, a quick snapshot, uh, I'm gonna kind of share three three different sets of data, uh, give you a snapshot of what today was like, uh, give you a snapshot of what uh, this last reporting window uh, looked like, so from the 16th through the 22nd, and then give you an overview uh, of the numbers from the beginning of the year. So just today, uh, September 22nd, uh, we had one uh, positive case at the preschool, uh, which resulted in 23 close contacts. Uh, and again, uh, you know, I, I know you know this, but every time a, a close contact is identified, that is a notification that needs to go out, uh, you know, obviously, and then, um, you know, sending phone calls, sending letters, uh, conducting meetings. Uh, we are obviously, you know, conducting test and stay this year. Uh, so that resulted in uh, 11 test and stays. So those tests had to be administered. Um, and so just at preschool alone, you can see the, the massive undertaking. Uh, at Williams, we did have, and I'm happy to talk more about the Williams if anybody has any questions. Obviously, that has been somewhat of a hotspot for us, uh, as you know, the last week or so. Uh, but just today, we had two more students. Um, I don't have the total number of close contacts. They were working on those this afternoon. Um, in terms of, you know, the Williams, you know, the one, one issue we run into over there is those students are just not eligible for the vaccination. So unfortunately, uh, when we go through the um, contact tracing, uh, those students you know, are not exempt from uh, having to quarantine or participate in testing. Uh, so again, I don't have kind of the follow-up numbers for the Williams uh, as of today because they're working on that. Um, and obviously the total numbers as we go, I, I, I don't have those because they were still working on it. What I do know though, in terms of test and stay and speaking to the nurse based on uh, numbers uh, prior to conducting this, this uh, last positive case uh, contact tracing, they're expecting to conduct 45 uh, tests tomorrow morning on uh, close contacts at school. So you can see again, um, 45 students, uh, each student needs to roughly wait 15 minutes for his or her results. Uh, so you can see the amount of time that that's actually going to take for our uh, nursing staff to conduct. Um, uh, and we also had a, a positive case over at the Merrill, uh, which did result in um, seven close contacts as well. Um, our Rainham Middle School had a positive case resulting in eight close contacts. And then the high school uh, had one positive case resulting in 26 close contacts. Uh, now of those uh, high school age students, uh, 16 were vaccinated uh, and 10 were participating, 
excuse me, participating in tests instead. Um, but that's not uncommon for our high school numbers. Some of our other sites, when we're having a positive case, um, with the exception of preschool today, that, that certainly was a large number, uh, isn't necessarily resulting in large numbers of close contacts. At the high school, it's a little bit different because these students are, again, changing classes throughout the day, or they may be participating in um, extracurriculars. Uh, some of our students are on you know, sports teams, and unfortunately, depending on the sport, it ends up a uh, majority of the sport uh, is identified as a close contact. So that was just today. So that kind of gives you a snapshot of what we were uh, dealing with today. Uh, during this reporting window, uh, we've had approximately 30 um, student cases, 30 positive student cases uh, at the various levels. Um, we've had 19, uh, as you know, at the Williams, three at Bridgewater Middle School, one at Merrill, two at RMS, and five at the high school. Uh, in terms of staff, we've had five total uh, for this reporting window uh, as well. Um, in terms of uh, close contacts, you know, that pushes us up to uh, over 100 uh, for this reporting window. Um, obviously, our highest number right now is at the high school. For this reporting window, we had 68 students identified as close contacts. 36 were vaccinated, uh, 31 are participating in test and stay. So again, that's 31 students uh, just during this reporting window that are down in the nurse's office in the morning waiting to take a test. Uh, and obviously, they're getting through that as fast as they can, but you know that uh, longer they're down there, that means, uh, unfortunately, they're missing class. So we are uh, trying to creatively explore ways to get our nursing staff extra assistance, uh, and we have some things in the works there. Um, from the beginning of the year, um, just to you know, provide you an overview, my time up. My, my <laughs> <laughs> um, so overall, from the beginning of school, so we went, we counted the beginning of school as that first day. Obviously, our staff uh, were back the week prior during uh, convocation. We did have some students participating in preseason activities, uh, but just to keep it consistent, and I can share some of those uh, preseason numbers with you. Uh, to keep it consistent, we started with uh, September 7th. Uh, so from September 7th, we have had five uh, Mitchell students test positive, 21 Williams students test positive, three Bridgewater Middle School, one Merrill, one La Liberty, four Rainham Middle School, and nine high school students. Um, we have had a total of uh, one staff at the preschool, three at Williams, and one staff member at the high school. Now, just to you know, provide you some additional information, uh, at the Mitchell School, we actually had uh, six end of summer positive cases. So by end of summer, meaning those first, uh, those last few days of the summer. So some of those students didn't actually report to the beginning of school, but they really had no impact on the start of school. There were no close contacts. Um, at Williams, we had three end of the summer cases. BMS, we had two end of the summer. Uh, Merrill, we didn't have any. La Liberty, we had two end of the summer. And the high school, we had six uh, end of the summer or preseason uh, for some of our uh, athletic programs <clears throat> um, as well. So just wanted to provide you those numbers. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the biggest numbers that stand out probably for you and, and certainly for me, the number of positive students that we've had at the Williams. Uh, and then obviously, you know, kind of the ripple effect at the high school. Uh, we've had nine positive students, which doesn't seem like much, but that has resulted in 117 close contacts at the high school. Uh, thankfully, 64 of those students are vaccinated. 47% uh, have participated in test and stay or are currently participating. And then obviously we've had a number of students uh, elect not to participate, so they're home quarantined. Um, so that, uh, that is a snapshot from the beginning of the year. Obviously, uh, you know, we're not too far into it and, and these numbers uh, certainly are, are taking up a lot of our time uh, from our nursing staff and, and not that they're balking at that because they, they know this is uh, their job, uh, but they are certainly stretched thin. And I know Mr. Swenson, uh, he was trying to do everything he can to support them at the building level uh, as well. And so we are looking at ways to, to get our nursing staff some additional assistance, whether it be trying to hire additional nurses, health proctors, health aides, whatever it may be, um, uh, or you know, trying to find a, a partner out there that can, that can help us as well. Um, so those are our uh, district numbers uh, overall. Again, if anybody has any questions about that, happy to talk more about any of those specific numbers. And then certainly if anyone has any questions about the Williams School, I'm happy to kind of update you there. Uh, Karen, if I may, um, is there anything we as a school committee can do to support the nursing staff or to support those initiatives that you have in mind to get them help? Because on top of all of this, 
their day-to-day -day work of medication handout, if you would, it is still key to the function of the day of the student. I think you know your support you know, through the budget, obviously, trying to get additional supports for um, the nurses. The one issue we're running into when we do you know, post these positions um, for additional nurses and whatnot, I think people may view this as kind of a, a, a one-year appointment or, you know, going into thought would probably be a one-year appointment last year, right? But here we are again. Um, and maybe to leave a security of a position they're currently in uh, might be a difficult choice for them and their family. So we are having you know, a continued issue with, um, you know, the filling of those positions that you guys have approved us to, to move forward with. So I think right now, I, we appreciate the support that you all give us. I think right now it's just, we're uh, we're in the trenches with this, these things. And, you know, myself and Mr. Powers and Mr. Joe Willows, who are over here with the preschool today and providing assistance with Mrs. Morelli. And it's all hands on deck, you know. And one thing that, you know, you see some alliance in every situation, you know, <clears throat> ones that are the most difficult is that I know that I have the most incredible team out there, that we are in the trenches of this together, and we know that we have the support of you folks as well. So things that you can do, Mr. Dolan, on a day-to-day, -day, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a true answer to that. We're just trying our best to uh, get out there and provide support to our nursing staff and our building admin when these situations are brought to our attention. And we get through it each and every day, and, you know, uh, it is, I am, you know, concerned our nursing staff i know it's it's very taxing on them on top of like you said their traditional responsibilities um so mr powers did take a meeting yesterday uh with the chiefs uh, of the fire department and that's something that you know we're going to explore as well uh, moving forward so hopefully that's something that you know we can kind of put into practice uh moving forward having maybe some of our paramedics in town come up and help with the test this day i know if you showed up today to, to assist us, and we're hoping to make that more of a consistent, um, you know, practice as well. So we'll be bringing some of that information forward to our budget sub because there will be a financial impact on that, and then possibly presenting that information um, at uh, the October school meeting as well. So, as Mr. Power said, we're trying to get as creative as we can uh, with um, you know limited resources that we have, but. We're not the only district in, in this situation, um, and we, we're gonna do what's best for our kids and staff and continue to fight on. So um, other than the support that you give us in terms of giving us permission for these positions, um, we appreciate that offer. Uh, but I, I think, again, I don't think there's any real magic pill to this thing. I think it's just kind of getting through day to day, taking it one day at a time, so. In, in that meeting, Mr. Swenson referenced it, uh, go very well. Both chiefs were very receptive to offering you know, any type of assistance they could. Uh, obviously, there's some logistics there that need to be worked out, and so those are things we're exploring now. But we did have uh, an offer today uh, for a couple of the fire firefighter paramedics to come down and help. And um, I know the Williams, just given the large number, uh, they hadn't you know gone through their testing so fast uh, yet. And Mr. Clark joked at our admin meeting today. Today was his, his best day yet because all those kids were back in class, and so. If that is something that we can explore to continue uh, to partner with them and, and they realize it, it, it could ebb and flow. Some days are going to be, uh, you know, a lot of students and, or possibly staff and some days there may not be any. Uh, but right now it's pretty consistent with uh, having a lot of tests to administer. We're even leading our administrative meeting today. Ad administrators requesting to be test, uh, trained to, to administer the test as well. So currently, if, uh, I believe three, three of our administrators are helping our nursing staff. They were trained themselves and they're actually gowning up uh, and helping uh, administer those tests to our students. Uh, just to share, Mr. Swenson, too, I, I know uh, you were curious to know. Uh, obviously, you know, we had released a link yesterday to our parents through PowerSchool uh, for them to upload proof of vaccination for their students uh, as of this afternoon. And again, it's only less than probably 24 hours later, uh, we had roughly 400, um, uh, 400 submissions of our students that are, that are eligible. So those are, those are good initial numbers. Um, our nursing staff does has a, ha, have a way to cross-reference those with the state database, uh, but obviously we wanted to be able to have that information in our own local system because 
you know, the more we have redundancy in place, uh, the better off we'll be uh, because we do know that systems crash. And so if the nurse, the state system crashes, the nurses can't have access to that. So at least we have a backup in power school. Uh, Ms. Padero uh, had also shared a, um, a Google form for our staff, a uh, confidential Google form to share their vaccination uh, rates. Uh, we obviously, you know, we're a little over 50% uh, response rate at this point, uh, but of those that have responded, 93% are vaccinated. So we're confident that, you know, those numbers are heading in the right direction. As you know, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has set the uh, target vaccination rate of 80% for October 1 for us to, to revisit. We haven't really received any additional information on, on what that may look like, uh, but, you know, obviously we're falling a little bit short right now of that vaccination rate. We did run another vaccination clinic in the beginning of September, and the second shot is coming up on the 1st. Um, we did have 42 additional uh, students, staff, and family members take advantage of that vaccination clinic. So uh, in, in speaking to the vendor that did that, they actually said those are really good numbers, just given the fact that, you know, this is, um, you know, some time now later in, in terms of that initial rollout, they're showing up at some vaccination clinics and no one's showing up. Uh, so the fact that we had 42, they, they felt as though that was a positive sign. So hopefully we, we get some more of this the second round. <clears throat> yeah, just you said about staff's vaccination status. Uh, if the president's idea of pushing it through OSHA goes through, will that affect the district as an employer? So uh, but my understanding of that, uh, and, and I don't claim to have all the answers on that, Mr. Mr. Fitzgibbons, I, I believe uh, because we're a a local public entity. I don't know if that 100% applies to us. Um, I know obviously employers with greater than 100 employees uh, have that ability to do that. Uh, but I believe I did read that read there was some stipulation in there about uh, the government, um, state and local uh, government agencies um, may not be able to, to do that. But to be determined, I think that's obviously something Ms. Codero, Mr. Swenson and I will have to bet through to see if that's uh, even possible. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, I know we're into the third hour since we started at six. So I'm going to be very brief. I do that. I just have uh, three questions. Uh, the numbers from the town of Bridgewater, um, does that include Bridgewater State University? Because I know some of those students, when they are positive, get reported back to their home communities, even though they're technically quarantining in their dorms here in Bridgewater. So I just I didn't know if those numbers actually included uh, Bridgewater State. Bridgewater State's numbers. Right now, don't, they don't go through the Bridgewater major. My understanding is is no. I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, to your point, Ms. Murr, I, I believe they are getting reported back to their home communities and uh, not back to the. To we've had home. we've had situations where our students contracted in Boston. They 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 ended up impacting Bridgewater and Rainier's numbers. Right, and that's why I wanted to see if those numbers were kind of. I know we have a correctional setting in Bridgewater also. I don't. Think they're going anywhere, <laughs> um, so they're not as transient as college students could be. And now, so I just didn't know how accurate those nights. You said 20, 24, 24 cases right water, but I just didn't know if that included uh, BSU student population. I believe the students again, they're they're where they reside um, outside of BSU is where those numbers are. Reported. Does the campus have a way of tracking internally, no matter where they reside? And are they able to share that data with the town of Bridgewater so we have a better idea of within the town of Bridgewater itself, whether you're a resident or not, they're technically still here. Well, not Rainbow, but Bridgewater. I know they are keeping their own internal data. Um, I'm not sure if they'd be willing to share. We could certainly ask. We have we've had a really good partnership with them. And Dr. That, Chris Frazier. That's getting shared with uh, but thank you. Uh, another thing, um, I have spoken to several parents in a bunch of different schools, uh, and there, there. I don't know if there is an inconsistency on the level of sanitation that we were originally um, and hygiene that we were originally pushing in the beginning of COVID. Uh, maybe we have, you know, loosened up a little bit. But you know, I'd like to find out if there is an. Maybe we can put a, uh, a, a unified front approach to this across the district that you know we still should maintain hygiene, 
uh, spraying down surfaces. I don't know if the if our janitorial staff is still doing the deep cleaning every night or not, but they're, they're spraying in the buildings, um, just not all areas of the buildings. But the science behind it, if you, if you read the science behind it, is that it's not transferable from surfaces. However, it's a situation where some of the areas, like the clusters that we've had over at um, the Williams, those areas have um, experienced the, the deep cleaning and the sanitation spray. Well, and I don't even just talk about the COVID, but just on the cold, because I know the student here in this building that had a sore throat and now is being forced to get a COVID testing because they actually had regular cold. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're still pushing forward, you know, germ prevention, we'll call it germ prevention. So students are again categorized as COVID symptoms. Mr. Pacheco does have a unified, uh, consistent cleaning protocol for all of our sites. Uh, we still obviously have access, uh, as you sure have seen it, the hand sanitizer at all our sites. So those are still available in all of our classrooms uh, to our students. Uh, the uh, disinfectant wipes are, are available to um, all classrooms. Um, and obviously, as Mr. Swenson said, the, the spraying. Um, Mr. Pacheco is implementing uh, nightly spraying in the nurse's office, as well as the medical waiting rooms. Uh, and then certainly if we do have any type of outbreaks, those are getting um, sprayed as well. And then all areas of the building are on a rotational spray. Um, so each area of the building is sprayed uh, on a rotating basis. So throughout the week, uh, the entire building will be uh, sprayed at some point. And my last point is, um, I know me personally, I, I, I was opposed to uh, Commissioner Riley's uh, authorization for masking, but I obviously I respect my committee's vote and I'm here, I masked. Um, in that original letter it, that went out on August 26th, it did state that students and staff with a, an exemption would be exempt from wearing a mask, but it says anybody else entering the building has to be masked. I know we had a, an issue tonight where we had, uh, assuming a parent wanted to come speak. Um, and my concern is that that letter doesn't specify if a parent or somebody visiting the building has an exemption. Because if they do, that's a legitimate exemption. I didn't know if language has changed since August 26th or if we can find out because I don't want to segregate a parent from coming in to sign out their child or sign in their child or attending a public meeting in the building if they do legitimately have an exemption. Um, I just want to find out, manager, through you, if you can maybe just ask the question from Desi, you know, how will we trick, I'm assuming they've had this question already. Um, if a visitor um, has, a, has an exemption by a physician that can be verified through whether it's the nurse leader or the building nurse, um, if they are allowed to enter the building. So, I want to make sure that, you know, a parent, if they have to sign a child, they can come sign a child at late. They need to sign them out early. They can come to the main office because right now, the way it's written, they can't even come in the building to do that. So I just want to make sure we can at least look into that a little bit um, and figure out. Like I said, I'm assuming this is not going to be a new question to them since school has started. Uh, they have probably already had it. So maybe there's some clarification like that, that we can use. We have some contacts up at the department that we can uh, reach out with that, with that question as to her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, just to give you a quick update on the Mitchell uh, Elementary School project. The project is currently on schedule with uh, no time lost in incidents. The interior and exterior framing and sheeting is ongoing. The hollow metal doors and window frames are currently being installed, and the waterproofing uh, is also continuing as well. The testing and inspections of rebar, concrete, uh, masonry is ongoing. The roof 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 membrane and a insulation installation, that's a sound twister there, uh, continues. Underground utilities uh, continued with plumbing and electricity being installed. Bacon uh, conducts weekly safety walks throughout the site and reports all uh, incidences to uh, the Procore system. The pre-construction meetings continue every uh, Tuesday, and um, we're going to move forward with those throughout the duration of the project. An introductory um, moving meeting took place on 
813 with Sterling, who's going to be our moving company. We met with all of the buildings that will be impacted by the moves, and uh, boxes have actually, believe it or not, started to be delivered so that when <coughs> teachers finish uh, teaching a unit, they can actually pack it away and store those boxes in the classrooms um, until uh, you know the moves begin. That way, we can do that proactively. And that this is, um, Holbrook remembers those moves back in 2015, and uh, hopefully, they will look um, you know, more proactive in our practices. Uh, this time around because we have some time to do so. Uh, upcoming construction activities throughout the month of September to the end of October continue to be electrical and telecommunication duct banks uh, being installed, the rain meter uh, piping installation, roof blocking and roof installation, excavating and backfilling the underground utilities that I just mentioned with plumbing and electricity, HVAC duct work, and pipes and hangers and exterior metal uh, stud frames and sheathing. All of this should be done by the end of September into early October. And we have our next um, upcoming school building committee meeting, which is meeting number 61 for those who are counting. Um, October 18th, we did move that. It did fall on the holiday originally of uh, the day, so we are going to move that to the 18th. And then we'll have um, school building meeting 62 on November the 8th. And just a reminder that all of these are open meetings with public comment. If um, folks from the community would like to attend, that's my report. Um, one thing I do want to mention, I mean, remiss if I didn't, I didn't realize it was Mrs. Marvel. Mrs. Marvel is also an incredible <laughs> parent volunteer for all of our athletics in Fulbright. So couldn't tell with the mask and the lighting and the rest. So thank you, Mrs. Marble, for being here for all that you do with Fulbra and all the youth athletics throughout our community. So thank you. Do we have any questions? Mr. Uh, are we staying on budget with the building? Uh, currently on time and under budget. This is uh, every uh, phrase, favorite phrase of any superintendent in uh, you know, a project like this. Yes, right. we're in good shape. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on, um, the MASC Delegate Assembly, I do not have a report this month. That will be on October. It's November 6th. Um, so I will bring as a report just so we can vote on a consensus of how uh, I will vote at the Delegate Assembly on November 6th in May. Um, next, we have Policy Subcommittee Report with Mrs. Holbrook. Thank you, Madam Chair. The policy subcommittee met on September 20th, and the following members were in attendance, Mr. Florence, Mrs. Conrad Labarento, Mr. Marrera, and myself. Also in attendance were Mr. Swenson and Mrs. McDougall, the recording secretary. All of the policies that are being brought forward tonight are housekeeping in nature. The first policy, the um, policy subcommittee reviewed was policy JJIF, which was the concussion policy. This policy was brought to our attention by Mr. Peter Smith, our athletic trainer, um, as needing to be reviewed every two years. At this time, no changes were recommended, but we did want it noted on the policy that we have done our due diligence and reviewed the policy as a subcommittee and the, the school committee also had the opportunity to review it by adding the review dates at the bottom of the policy. So this policy does not need to be voted on as there were no changes. It was basically just a formality to inform the full com committee that it has been reviewed. Thank you. Okay, the next policy in question is policy JJIF-R, Athletic Concussion Regulations. Mr. Smith updated this policy with the assistance of Ms. Brennan, our nurse leader and the superintendent. This policy needs to be reviewed on an annual basis. The one update that was suggested was changing the impact baseline test to neurocognitive baseline test as impact baseline testing is a brand name. And by using a brand name, we are requiring the district to use that brand and that brand only. So by admitting the brand name, we ensure that the BRRHS trainer 
may use the most up-to-date authorized testing available and the change aligns with the present practice. So in the form of a motion to accept housekeeping updates to policy JJIF-R, athletic concussion regulations. Second. All right, Mrs. Holbrook has made a motion, seconded by Mr. Herrera. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The next policy is also housekeeping in nature. It is policy JGA, Personnel Policies Goals. Um, in sentences number one and five, changes were made for clarification purposes. In the form of a motion to accept housekeeping updates to policy GA, Personnel Policies Goals. Second. Right. Mrs. Holbrook has made a motion, seconded by Mr. Marrera. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The next policy reviewed was policy GBA, Equal Employment Opportunity. And this policy is also housekeeping in nature. We cross-referenced our non-discrimination policy with it. And additionally, under the cross-references, they are now aligned with our non-discrimination policy. So we need a motion to accept housekeeping updates to policy GBA, Equal Employment Opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mrs. Holbrook has made a motion, seconded by Mrs. Conrad. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The next policy to be re was reviewed and updated is policy GBEA, Staff Ethics Conflict of Interest. The policy subcommittee thought it may behoove us to add the state ethics training since these are mandated trainings to this policy. This training is to be completed every two years and is sent out at the beginning, beginning of each school year to those employees who are on the cycle for that year through our envisions portal. So in the form of a motion to accept updates to policy GBEA, staff ethics, conflict of interest. Holbrook has made a motion, seconded by Mr. Fitzgibbons. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the final <clears throat> policy we reviewed was policy GBEB, staff conduct. And this policy is housekeeping in nature as well. And the wording in number one was changed for clarification. And number six was added to reflect what we are doing presently in the uh, district. So in the form of a motion to accept housekeeping updates to policy GBEB, staff con conduct. Okay, that was a motion by Mrs. Holbrook, seconded by Mr. Marrera. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that concludes my report of the policy subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Holbrook. Um, and next we have Boston Planning Subcommittee Report to Mr. Florence. Thank you. On September 1st at 5.30 p.m., the Long Range Planning Committee met to review and finalize the superintendent's evaluation. Committee members present at the meeting were Mrs. Conrad, Mr. Marrera, and myself as Long Range Committee Chair. In this meeting, we finalized Mr. Swenson's goals for this year and selected two focus indicators for each of the four performance standards to evaluate Mr. Swenson for the 2021-2022 school year. In your committee folder, you will find the superintendent evaluation form with the four proposed goals and the two selected focus indicators for each of the four standards highlighted. We made sure that the proposed goals aligned with the five-year student success plan to help the district work towards completing that plan. I would now like to make a motion to approve the following goals and focus indicators for Mr. Swenson to be evaluated for the 2021-2022 school year. For student learning goal, uh, throughout the school year, I'll oversee the revision of the curriculum review cycles to ensure all staff are utilizing the Massachusetts State Frameworks assessment and assessment data to drive instruction. This aligns with pillar number two, uh, establish a cohesive, rigorous, district-wide system of teaching and learning. First, professional practice goal. Uh, throughout the year, I will oversee the implementation of professional development that supports social and emotional well-being of students as it pertains to pillar number one, safe and support schools. For the district improvement goal number one, throughout the school year, I will monitor and evaluate the accomplishments of the action plans of pillar number three, technology, ensure access to technology that is effective, is effective and efficient, 
and meets the educational needs of the district. And district improvement goal number two, oversee the implementation of proper recycling in all buildings district-wide. And I will monitor and evaluate the accomplishments of the action plans of pillar number four facilities, establish and maintain environmentally and operationally safe school facilities. And then the following uh, focus indicators were selected for the four evaluation standards. So um, for standard one, instructional leadership, uh, 1B instruction ensures that practices in all settings reflect high expectations regarding content and quality of effort and work, engage all students, and are personalized to accommodate diverse learning styles, needs, interests, and levels of readiness. And the second one is uh, 1E, data-informed decision-making, uses multiple sources of evidence related to student learning, including state, district, and school assessment results and growth data to inform school and district goals and improve organizational performance, educator effectiveness, and student learning. Uh, for standard two, management operations, uh, we selected uh, 2A, environment, develops and executes effective plans, procedures, routines, and operational systems to address a full range of safety, health, emotional, and social needs. And we also like the 2E fiscal systems, develops a budget that supports the district's vision, mission, and goals, allocates and manages expenditures consistent with the district and school level goals and available resources. Uh, for standard three, family and community engagement, uh, 3A engagement was selected, actively ensures that all families are welcome, members of the classroom and school community and can contribute to the effectiveness of the classroom, school district, and community. Uh, 3C was also selected, communication, engages in regular two-way culturally proficient communication with families and community stakeholders about student learning and performance. And finally, for standard four, professional culture, 4B, cultural proficiency, ensures that policies and practices enable staff members and students to interact effectively in a culturally diverse environment in which students, backgrounds, identities, strengths, and challenges are respected. And finally, uh, 4C, communication, demonstrates strong interpersonal, written, and verbal communication skills. All right, uh, Mr. Ford's made a motion. Second. Second by Mr. Fitzgerald. Second. Second by Mr. Fitzgerald. Second. 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 Second we're looking at um, for next year, our goal is to first off finalize these goals in the summertime. Um, and so to do that, Mr. Swenson will bring the, his goals to us much earlier at the end of June when we put up. So our goal is um, that he will have a mid-cycle, well, each, meet, uh, each meeting is going to report out on one of his um, goals to show us progress. And then he'll have a mid-cycle. We decided we ended up in March. So, so February, February, yeah, yes, so we're going to go February for the mid-year cycle, and then he will present in May his final presentation of his goals, and that way we can do the evaluation for the June meeting, and then immediately start planning the next year. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do members have questions? Okay. Great. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you so much, Mr. Flores and Long Range Committee for that. Um, report from the business office is next with Mrs. Lucido and Ms. Robichaud. Good evening, Madam Chair, um, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. I think we'll start with our Treasury Department first and let Mrs. Robichaud go first. Good evening. I'm here to update you on what's going on in the Treasurer's office since the start of school. We are look we are working on the E&D certification for fiscal year 21. This includes the preparation and submittal of the statement of indebtedness, which was submitted well in advance of the due date. Currently, we are working on the Treasurer's Year End Report, which is due on September 30. It is my int intention to submit it by September 27. We have scheduled the auditors for the beginning of October to begin the fiscal year 2021 audit. 
the auditors have requested some information prior to their visit, which includes pulling bank reconciliations, bank statements, outstanding checklists, deposit receipts, 941 quarterly reports, and the schedule of long-term debt. The daily tasks of taking in receipts and posting them to the general ledger is ongoing. This year, we hired a records data entry secretary to assist with maintaining filing systems throughout the central office, as well assist with daily posting of receipts. It is my intention to solely increase the types of work he is exposed to in the treasurer's office. And this concludes my update. Um, in the business office, uh, we're working very closely with the treasurer's office. And currently, right now, we're very uh, submerged in doing reporting for the previous fiscal year. So one of the things that we're working on is the end of year report, which is from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's a culmination of everything fiscal that happened in FY21. It's very complex. It's very detailed. Um, and it asks for information in several different ways. There are about 20 schedules that have to be done and everything has to prove out. So that's due this uh, September the 30th, uh, actually October 1st. I'm planning on trying to get it in sooner. I'm almost finished. Um, so that's one of the main focuses. The other thing is our projects that we've been doing been working with you know MSBA and getting those pro pays in for the Mitchell Elementary School. We're right on time. We've got everybody submitting all the September um, invoices together so that they'll all be paid together so we won't have some that have been mismatched and you know I'm still paying for May here when we're already on you know October or whatever. So those are coming in, they come in regularly. I'm kind of like a dog on a meat wagon, trying to make sure that uh, those things are coming in and that money's turning around and coming back to us so we can get some credit for it. Um, the other projects that we're working on, obviously the overlay project that's been ongoing uh, and the auditorium um, replacement of the seating. And um, they are really in bad, bad shape. Uh, we had uh, several folks come in on I think it was the 21st yesterday uh, to take a look at everything. It was a pre-bid conference and uh, questions can be answered up until September 28th with a bid opening date of October 1st. So we'll be able to look at fabrics and things like that very shortly. Um, and let's see, uh, also um, talking about the budget and e and certification, I've been working very closely with Natasha on getting all of those documents that the auditors want while also helping her with the certification of E&D because both of us have to sign off on various areas of those reports. And uh, lastly, we'll be working as soon as I get these due dates <laughs> accomplished here, then I'll be working on the FY22 budget more. And we should have at that point, everybody in the budget. I know we've probably got some new hiring coming in uh, with Mrs. Uh, Cadero, but um, we're trying to get everybody in, in the right place. And then we'll start looking at, did we budget as well as we thought we had, or did people move around? So that's um, basically what's going on at this time of year in the business office. And um, I don't know if you have any questions, but I'd be happy to try to answer them. <laughs> We're still freezing the budget on October 1. Yes. Yes. And I've told folks to get things in so that we can do that. We also had a, um, a retroactive pay. Uh, for an employee who got a um, increase, a lateral move from the bachelor's five to a master's five. Um, and for some reason in fiscal year 21, it, it didn't get changed and um, the person wasn't getting paid the additional money. So we will need to do a transfer from E&D 
in the amount of $7,283 so that we can clear up that issue. We can fix this year, no problem. Well, I think she wants us to make a motion. Say, do you want us to motion that? Yes, please. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. What was the number? 7,283. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to uh, transfer $7,283 from ED from last year to this year's budget for back pay for that information. Motion has been made by Mr. Dolan. Do we have a second? Second. Any questions please. on that? Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. Personnel report for September 22nd, 2021 is as follows. At the high school, we hired Stacy Fall Weidren from a sub to an ESP on 831-21. Benjamin Lovell from temporary sub ESP to ESP 831-21. Kathleen Morrow from building-based assistant to security proctor, 9-7-2021. Nicole Silva, ESP 915 2021. Stacy Silverman from sub to prop one year appointment, 97 2021. Jody Spryer from substitute to proctor one year appointment, 97 2021. Kim Williamson, interventionist, one year appointment, 831 2021. Tara Lucetti, ELL teacher, one year appointment, high school, 831 2021. At the Bridgewater Middle School, we made the following appointments. Alexandra Lopes to Proctor, one year appointment, 927-2021. Annette Sarantopoulos, sub to Proctor, one year appointment, 97-2021. Cody Smith, Proctor, one year appointment, 920-2021. At the Rainham Middle School, we made the following appointments. Victoria Coleman, Proctor, one year appointment, 831-2021. Jesse Berry, ESP, 914-2021. Abigail Clark, ESP, 921-2021. Clinton Eastman from sub to proctor, one year appointment, 97 2021. Barbara Young, ESP, 831 2021, in the pre K. At the MG Williams Intermediate School, we made the following appointments Kathleen Avtijas from proctor to secretary, academic year, 818 2021. Erin Brown, proctor, library, 97 2021. Kathleen Gibson from grade two, teacher to ELL teacher, one year appointment, split with GMES, 831 2021. Chelsea Gurley from sub to proctor, 9-7-2021. Helene Morera, proctor, one year appointment, 9-9-2021. Ariana Silva, ESP, 9-27-2021. At the George Mitchell Elementary School, we hired Samantha Alves, grade two teacher, one year appointment, 8-31-2021. Anne Marie Cretion, proctor, one year appointment, 9-7. Vicki Hasselbecker, school psychologist, 8-31. Donna Boothby, from prop to the ELL teacher, one year appointment, 831. Colleen O'Donnell, proctor, one year appointment, 97. Nicole Weiss, speech language pathologist, 831. At LB Merrill Elementary, we made the following appointments Michelle Oliver, ESP, 831. Tracy Ray Ray, special education teacher, 831. At La Liberty Elementary School, we made the following appointments Kim Day, from sub to proctor, one year appointment, 97. Tara Jean Graver, school psychologist, voluntary transfers from GMES 831. Diana Lawson, special ed teacher, 831. We received the reti uh, following retirement notices. Karen Greenberg, special education teacher, BMS, 630-2022, will be 18 years of service. Sandra Kelly, science teacher at the high school, 630-2022, will be 14 years of service. Cynthia Spagna, ESP, at RMS Pre-K, 9-15-2021, after 20 years of service. We received the following resignations. Thomas Bresnahan, Assistant Principal at the High School, effective 11-30-2021.
Lindsay Smith, custodian at the high school, 10-1-2021. Tracy Thomas, proctor at BMS, 8-26-2021. Megan Ward, speech language, speech language pathologist at GMES, 8-10-2021. Maria Robbins, school psychologist at La Liberty, 8-16-2021. Meredith Stetson, special education at La Liberty, 8-3-2021. At the last school committee meeting, one of the uh, school committee members asked for statistics of the reasons why staff have resigned. Following other statistics for reasons staff have resigned at or since the end of the 2020-2021 school year. Medical reasons, 5.26%. Another opportunity, 57.89%. Personal reasons, 36.84. Note, some examples of personal reasons are caring for a family member, to stay at home with their own children, Moving out of state, job status, uh, dissatisfaction. If there are no questions, that concludes my personnel report. Any questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next is new business. We have approval of payroll warrants. Um, I will attain, entertain a motion to approve payroll warrants dated August 26, 2021, and September 9, 2021. Madam Chair, I repeat myself. Okay, thank you, Mr. Madam Chair, as uh, per the uh, last report, my uh, wife is currently a project of the district, so I will be abstaining from night to the foreseeable future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, second. Second. By Mr. Forbes. Um, all in favor? Okay. Right. Any opposed? Okay. And then we have two extensions. Thank you, everyone. Um, and next, we have acceptance of gifts. We do have one other gift that we did not move up. Yes, it's uh, for uh, front screen educational grants. And the amount is $80. And it is an annual um, automatic grant that is given. To the school district. I will entertain a motion uh, to accept the gift of the eighty dollars to the uh, from the Front Street Educational. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Moreira, seconded by Mr. Kinsley. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Um, any other business? I do not have anything. And lastly, we have our second public comment. Um, as stated earlier, the school committee welcomes information, concerns, and opinions from those attending the meeting in order to give those wishing an opportunity to speak, ensure compliance with open meeting law and other legal obligations, and avoid disruption at the meeting. The committee will not engage with the speaker or with one another in deliberation on comments as they are presented during open comment period. At its discretion, the committee may schedule issues raised by a speaker for deliberation at a future meeting. Um, the chair will now open public comment for a period of 12 minutes for policy PDH and would ask anyone who wishes to speak to approach the microphone, provide your name and address, and keep your comments to under three minutes. Um, do we have anyone in the public that would like to speak? All right. Um, we do not have anyone. And lastly, announcements. <coughs> The next uh, regular school committee meeting will be Wednesday, October 27th at 7 p.m. And that will be at the high school lecture hall. Uh, do we have any other announcements by committee members? All right, seeing none. Um, this concludes our school committee meeting. I will entertain a motion to adjourn at 9.46. So motion made so by Mr. Mera, seconded by Mr. Fitzgibbons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you everyone and have a wonderful night. Thank you.